get this recording, get my backup recording. We're up. We are live. And thanks for being here, Brent. I really appreciate it. You doing okay tonight? Doing good. Doing good, Chris. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And and just to get the conversation going and let the audience kind of know what they're about to be listening to here. And I don't want to steal your thunder or your parade or something, but I, you have a story that yeah. seems to be very compelling and very impactful and that teaches life lessons. And, you know, it may be not an actual story that most people would probably tend to hear, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so, and I guess, so before we uh, start, or far before I start saying too much, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and, you know, if you want to kind of start getting into your story a little bit and we'll kind of go from there. Sure. I, so what I'm doing now is, is, is I, uh, I uh, went to prison in 2014, January of 2014, and I got a five-year sentence to Leavenworth. And I was, um, I was one of those guys that had a father that went to prison when I was 15 years old. So I said, this had never happened to me. And then I was standing at the gates of Leavenworth. So I, I wrote a book called Nightmare Success. Um, it's um, Loyalty, Betrayal. Uh, life behind bars, adapting, finally breaking free—a memoir, and and I also host a uh, podcast called Nightmare Success in and Out, where I actually interview. The idea of that podcast is: is what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? How do you adapt? How do you survive? How do you overcome? And the the common thread on that uh, podcast is: is that everybody went to prison, but everybody has a different way of overcoming that. So, um, yeah, my Going back a little bit, Chris, growing up as a kid, I mean, man, I, I think I had a pretty normal childhood. I thought, you know, I had one of those where, you know, it was the seventies and eighties and the kids were playing in the, you know, in the neighborhood and, you know, we rode our bikes and we picked teams to play touch football, sometimes tackle football, basketball, baseball. We had a Creek in the back and it was a smaller town. Uh, Southwest Missouri. And, uh, you know, life was pretty, pretty normal. I loved it. Sure. And, and, and it, so I think in my early part of my life, I kind of compartmentalized my childhood because I had a dad that, well, and everybody has, you know, everybody has the figure of their dad in their life. Well, my dad was a kind of bigger than life character. You know, his, his short narrative is, is that he, or bio is, is that, you know, he, he came from a really small town, about 3,000 people. He won a state championship in basketball. He's a valedictorian. He went to D1, played basketball, nice. got out, went to law school, graduated number one in his class, zoomed out of there, won some big cases, and then got into a lot of different businesses. And at, you know, sev seventh, eighth grade, I was like, man, I just want to be that guy. I mean, wow. And it was funny, Chris, one night, you know, it's kind of like when you don't expect anything, yeah. something hits you upside the head and you're like, wow, I didn't even, I never saw that coming. Well, my dad, after dinner, calls my brother and I into the living room and he says, boys, I got to tell you something, sit down. And he said, I've gotten myself into a heap of trouble with the bank I own. And I don't think I'm going to be able to get out of it. And uh, to be able to move forward, I'm going to plead guilty. And, I, and, and I, I, my <laughs> his mouth was moving, but I, it, it, I, the, it, was, it was all blurry to me. I was like, what? This is like the, the you know, idol, the golden touch guy. Yeah. And by the time he got done speaking, he said, and we're going to move so that we can get a new start. And I was like, oh, my God. This is like the weirdest, awfulest family get together we've ever had. And so life changed quite a bit at that moment. But I've got to say that it changed quite a bit. And I, when I say I compartmentalized it, we moved to St. Louis, Missouri, much bigger town, uh, kind of that scary, you know, metropolis. And, and uh, we moved in in the summertime and dad was going to go to prison and he'd been sentenced to six months in prison. And, and 
There was a couple of things I was thinking, Chris, when all this was going on. I was a 15 year old kid going to a new high school, you know, all new people. We moved into a new neighborhood. Um, and when you move into a new neighborhood, dad wasn't with us. You know, sure. he was he was in prison. And there's so many questions that happen when you're that age. You know, where's your dad? You know, is your mom a widow? Is she divorced or what? So we decided that we were going to say that dad was working out of town. Okay. And we would go visit him, which was kind of true. Dad did have a prison job uh, down the street, Marion, Illinois, about two and a half hours away. But uh, it was a weird time period because starting as a freshman in high school, a new school, nobody knew what was going on in my life. And it was a weird thing to hold at that point because, you know, I, there was a couple of things that came to my mind when I was that age. First of all, I was driving to prison, you know, and, and I was thinking when we were driving there, it's like, wow, we're that family. I mean, we came from, and at the time we were, you know, pretty well to do family. And we went, from that to dad losing everything and we're living in a small house and in the suburbs and, and um, I, I, that idea that we're that family that goes to prison now, we're, we're that family. And, you know, after visiting dad for the first time, he came out and I thought, well, you know, you don't know how your dad's going to look when he comes out, you know, first time to visit you in prison, is he going to turn into a prison creature? Is he okay? You know, what, what's going to happen? And he looked okay. He was fine. He made some friends and, I felt like he was going to be all right. But the one thing that I thought when we left was that'll never happen to me. Right. I will never be in this situation. And the crazy thing is, is that, oh gosh, I was 15. I was 47 when I went to prison. That many years later, I ended up in a situation where my dad, myself, and four other people went to prison. and you know, how in the world that can happen and how in the world you can say to yourself as a 15 year old kid, man, that'll never happen to me happen. And that's, you know, the crazy part of the story. Um, how does something like that happen? Yeah. I mean, that's the first I've heard of something like this, you know, and just, I've never had anybody in my life that I know that went to prison besides, you know, in college where a couple of my friends probably ended up in the drunk tank, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, but other than that, you know, how, yeah. How does something like that happen? And, and going back with your story though, I mean, it's just so everyone knows that, you know, you, it wasn't like, you know, you were, I guess like going down a road to be, you know, ultimately end up in prison, but you know, you were a CEO for a while. Right. And you were recognized right. a certain big, you know, fortune 500 company. So it wasn't like you're, and I don't want everyone to get this bad, image in their head that you're a bad dude you were just destined to go to prison so i want to make sure that, you know you actually you know well no were, i i and i can fill that in a little bit chris because when so when dad got out of prison there was one company that remained and strangely enough it remained because he had put this company in a family trust so he did it wasn't in his name and I would say probably you would call it a very unsexy company. It it was uh, it was called National Prearranged Services, and it um, it prearranged your funeral before you died. So mm -hmm. you, you would pay for your funeral ahead of time. You would you know figure out who your pallbearers were and and uh, your songs and everything that would go along with that, so that your family wouldn't have to deal with that at the time of death. It took the burden off of them, and it it, it paid for the funeral and it froze the cost of time. It was kind of a newer concept back in the 79, 80, 81 time period. And so dad got out and he started creating a new company okay. and uh, it started to grow. And so as I got through my college years, I was going to be a trial attorney. I thought that'd be cool. You know, I took political science, theater. And so I thought, I'm going to be this big trial attorney. And my dad was an attorney at the time where he lost his law license with the prison. So oh, no. I was, I, that was my, that was my path. So I can say that as a college kid, I, Chris did pretty good grade wise. I think I graduated like a 3.4, you know, I didn't set the world on fire, but I did all right. Sure. But 
you put a standardized test in front of me. I mean, I registered on the dumb, 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 dumb category. I, like to that. I, always, I always blamed it on that I was left-handed, but I know there's a lot of really good left-handed attorneys that got past the LSAT. So I just couldn't do it. I was just, I don't know. I, it was, you know, you put an essay in front of me, I can write all day. But so I had to kind of figure out there was a fork in the road for me. Um, everything I had planned on my plan A turned into a plan B. And one of the things that I realized was, is that over my college years, I'd done some sales and stuff. And I thought, well, I'm pretty good at this. It's kind of reminded me, I played a lot of sports and football and basketball in, in high school. And I think it's kind of sales kind of felt that way. It was kind of felt like you had a scoreboard. Didn't matter how old you were. If you were good, you play, you know, if you can close the deal, you win, you keep score. So uh, I went to my dad. I said, Dad, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what if I came into the company? And I said, my only problem is I, you carry such a long shadow. Is there any place that I could go where I could just pass fail? And if I could make this happen. And so he said, yeah, he said, there's, we just opened up Texas down there in Austin. Um, He said, we signed up a funeral home. I said, oh man, sign me up. Austin, Texas, you know, 22, 23 years old. So I went down to Texas and I found out that I was pretty good at this. And so we built a big region and uh, away we went. And at that time we had got the company to the point where we had a sales company and we had an insurance company. Okay. And so the sales company created the contracts of the funerals and the, insurance company funded those funerals when, when they were due. So my dad loved the insurance side. He, he was just the opposite of me. He liked numbers. He liked the markets. He liked all that. And I liked the sales side. So it was kind of a perfect marriage within a family company. And uh, we continued to grow that thing. And it grew from three states to 22 states. My brother came into the business in the 90s. Um, and then we created kind of a sexy company. And that company was one where it got a lot of press. And it came from an idea, Chris, that my brother used to hit the play button when people were talking, get a recorder, capture their, their, their uh, without them knowing their conversations. Well, he had captured my grandmother and my mom talking at the kitchen table. My grandmother died three years prior. And he found this cassette tape and he came down. I was home from college and he said, uh, listen to this. This is grandma on here. And we, and we, get, we sat around the table as a family and said, wow, that's amazing. You know, you, you, just three years, you kind of lose the inflection in her voice, the way she laughs and talks. And then we started talking about, isn't it crazy that like, you know, Queen Elizabeth dies and you expect the highlight of her life. President dies, you expect the highlight of her life. Celebrity dies, you expect the highlight. But nobody's the filmmaker for everybody else. Sure. So our big idea was, is we were going to become the filmmakers for everybody else. And we charted out to create that company. It was called Forever Enterprises. Um, We created a production company. We started buying cemeteries because we figured that's where people go to remember. And we started going to people who own cemetery property and creating life stories for them and then put them on a touchscreen console. So that if, Chris, you went and you had your son or daughter and they didn't know your grandmother, they could go to this touchscreen console and and voila, there she is. And you're connecting to generations. And there was an old African proverb that said when someone dies, a library burns. So our whole idea was to be a library of lives. So um, it really took off. Uh, You know, nobody had done anything different in that arena in the last 125 years, you know, it was just, just hadn't been done. And so we got a lot of press. We got, you know, the front page of the wall street journal, fortune magazine, Forbes, um, HBO made a documentary called the young and the dead. And that spawned itself into Alan ball who came over and said, Hey, I, I saw the young and the dead. You know, I think this would make a great TV series taking people that are in this business and, and doing something that's never been done in TV. And that was six feet under. So, and my brother actually became a writer on that show with Six Feet Under, even though we were still in the business of doing what we were doing. So life was great. You know, life was great. 
course. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was all good. There. You know, at, at that time I'm about, uh, you know, late thirties, you know, I've married my, my wife, who's a homecoming queen. We've had three daughters. I have got a, you know, a vacation home. Um, couldn't have been any better. Sure. And that's kind of when you get hit upside the head and when somebody blindside yeah. kicks you. And that's uh, what happened. It's, we, like in a, it's like in the movies when you get to a certain point, you know, everything's going well and you just know eventually. When's it going to happen? Yeah, well, something bad's <laughs> going to happen. You know? Well, the short story is, is that um, I got a phone call one day, and this is really how it happened, Chris. Literally, I'm at the gas station. I'm filling up my gas tank, and I get a call from our president of our insurance company. He says, Brent, I just got out the weirdest phone call. He said, this lady called me from Ohio, and she says she's got information that's going to put her company down. Oh, no. Nice. And it, like a something just kind of went through me, and I kind of had felt this before because when I was a kid at 15, I felt it. But this was a lot more intense because I'm in it now. You know, before it was my watching my dad, I'm in this company, I'm doing, you know, the things we're doing. And and what had happened was, is that we had got, not to get too far in the weeds here. So when you have an insurance company, sometimes you will reinsure that business out. So the business that you write, you basically paid a commission by a much bigger company and they take the liability. Okay. And it, it's, it, it works well for both. You, you get paid up front, you earn a little bit less money. And they take the liability, but you get to use them as you build your business. That we've got this A plus rated company. Well, we had the largest reinsurance company in the world, and they got a little backwards in the market. And we had just cut a really good reinsurance contract with them. And they came back to my dad and and uh, our company attorney and said, "Hey, what do you think about? It? We need to rethink this reinsurance contract just a little bit." And Dad. Said, I don't know if it would. Yeah, I think dad had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because he came from a small town. He was always trying to prove everybody. He was wickedly smart. I get that. To try to prove that, hey, I'm the smartest guy in the room and our contract doesn't say that. And hell no. Probably not a good idea. And it ended up to be, it went into arbitration. And when you go into arbitration with us, the company the size of a country, um, they, they bled us out. In, in attorney's fees, and we started spending, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars, and started hitting our capital and surplus. Really became kind of a big deal, and that started to leak in. Even though that's a private proceed, proceeding with uh, arbitration, it started to leak into these twenty-two states we were in. In a regulatory environment, Chris, that any type of smoke is absolutely not assumed, but they believe there's a fire and that's when, you know, the sirens go off and that's what happened to us. The sirens went off. Oh. Everybody wanted to know everything and it started spinning. So the crazy thing that happened was, like I said before, I never really liked, in fact, I took political science. I didn't even have to take math. I didn't like math. And so my arrogance of this whole thing was, is that, yeah, that money that I'm creating over here goes to that insurance company. I don't like that, but that was really a bad, bad thing because I owned it. You know, it was in my name. Yeah. So, you know, looking back on that, I should have paid a lot closer attention to what we were doing, how we were doing it and what we were doing. So when it came down to the house is burning, my dad said, Hey, Brent, we got to go out and talk to these regulators. I can't talk to them because I'm an ex-felon. I think you're the guy to go out and, 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 and speak our story. And at that time, Chris, you know, I wanted to do that. Um, you know, there were, we had a, a lot of people working for us. Uh, I was at the point in my life that I thought I could do everything and I thought I could save the day. And I, and I thought, Tell me what I need to know and I'll go out and I'll do it. And so I flew around to all these different places and um, I did not save the day. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was in a tailspin and we went down in, in burning flames and we went to receivership. Then it went to a criminal investigation and then it went to an indictment and there were six people that were indicted. And that's how it 
crashed and burned. And it was, it was, it was tough. We went through six years of going through the process with the federal government. Oh, wow. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody, Chris, because I don't doubt it. what you do in that situation is you start fighting and you keep fighting and you go to bed thinking you're fighting, you wake up, you think you're fighting and the, the hole keeps getting bigger, keeps getting darker and you run out of money, you run out of assets. And um, in the meantime, your family's going through it too. And it's just a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a thing that you can't describe really in, unless you actually are in the event when it happens, because there's nothing like it. There's nothing like getting an indictment that says the United States of America versus your name. Mm. Yeah. There's nothing I, like that. I don't doubt it. Wow. Wow. So at the time, at the time, Chris, I have, I have three daughters and at the time they were teenagers and we hadn't held anything back. And this was a big, huge uh, press event. I mean, it was a national story. Um, but we had, we kind of cocooned ourselves in because we had really good support from our friends and, and the kids had support from their friends. And so we just kind of stayed within that cocoon. We didn't read the newspapers, didn't see and, and listen to the news. Um, but it finally came down to a point where you just say, Man, I'm worn out. I'm tired. Sure. I, I don't. I don't know how I could go any further. And that's, you know, that point where you get to is is, you know, you don't know when you're at that point until you're at that point. But after six years of it, they gave us a plea agreement. Uh, my daughter said, "Dad, you can't. <laughs> you can't. This has been a tsunami of bad. You can't go to trial. Uh, you know, they stack charges. You know, our charge, my charges was was um, I allowed a, an ex felon to work in the business of insurance. Uh, that carried a five year sentence. Wow. Um, the, the once they deem your corporation to be a conspiracy of, of fraud, then you've got anything you mailed out is mail fraud. Anything you wired is wire fraud. Anything you bought over those thirty years is money laundering. So they can stack those charges as high as they want. And so you're looking at that going forward. And so we decided as a family that we're done with that. And I was looking at um, no time to five years. Okay. And um, we all went down. It's kind of like the old Braveheart thing where you go to the that town square where they're looking and they're pulling, you know, yeah. William Wallace apart. <laughs> yeah. We were, you know, the, the, the courtroom's packed and she's got a three ring binder and that was it. And I got five years. And I tell you, the all like all the air and the breath came out of me. It was just, you know, oh my God, five years is is, you know, five years of, of whatever you're gonna do for the next five years is gonna be five years now that is the unknown yeah. that you've never experienced. You'll never know until you get in there. And you're gonna be away from your family. So um and it was kind of weird because I said, Chris, you know, I'll never, I'll never have this happen to me. <laughs> this is never going to happen to me. Do, do and that, it happened. Do you think that they were trying to, you said you could either got zero years or five years and they were trying to make an example of you. And that's why yeah, I think max. she pretty much max. My dad got 10 years. Um, our CFO got seven years. Our investment advisor got 10 years. Our attorney I uh, got three years. It was, it was quite a, um, it was, it's quite a deal. Wow. Wow. And that one moment when you kind of, you got your letter, you know, United States versus Brent. Yeah. Now, is that where like your rock bottom moment right there? You thought? No, I'll tell you my rock bottom moment was, is that you're so busy fight. That's a really good question, Chris, because I, I did have a rock bottom moment. You never forget your rock bottom moment. I, I don't doubt it. Um, my rock bottom moment was, is the night that I decided that I was given in. My family was at our vacation house. Uh, I was at my house, um, alone. We had a family phone call. That's my dad, my mom, uh, my brother, my wife and me. And, and we, you know, we decided that we're going to, we're going to throw away the towel. And we got off that phone and I think it was the first time, Chris, that I realized, wow, 
you're going to be an ex felon. You're going to be a felon, and you're going to be an ex felon. And it hadn't really sunk into me. How am I going to live like that? Yeah. You know what? What does that mean for me? And I really got into a real poor me. And it was the first time it had happened. It was just, uh, it was like all, all the adrenaline had left that we were giving in. Tomorrow was going to the courthouse and, and pleading guilty. And I was, you know, I had a drink and I had another drink and I started thinking, good God, Brent, this is big. This is, this is life changing. This is, you know, your wife has been a warrior through this. Does she deserve to have this going forward? Do your kids deserve to have you as a stain, you know, as a dad that's an ex? And I just went down this deep hole. And I started thinking, I don't know. Would I just be better just to exit stage left and just let everybody be? Sure. And I had never been in that position before and never thought those things. Had another drink. You know, I got out a piece of paper and I wrote out all the friends that have been, you know, the the best they've been. And, and you know, Julie, what a you know, warrior and superhero has she been through this? And the kids, here's your your fatherly advice. And got another drink and went down, grabbed the keys of the car, got in the car in the garage. And I didn't realize if I was either going to go hit a tree or just let it run. And yeah. it was like, Chris, something hit me. And I, I remember, <laughs> as I'm saying, I'm, I almost have the hair stand up on my arms. It's like, Oh my God, bro. What in the hell are you doing? You're the guy, the grass, the, the glass half full guy. You're the optimistic guy. You're the guy that this would be the worst legacy. You could give your wife, your kids and everybody else that supported you. What are you thinking? Yeah. And I thought at that moment, that rock bottom moment, regardless of what happens. And there was a lot that was going to happen going forward that I had no idea how I was going to handle it, but I thought I'm going to, I'm going to survive. I'm going to be a survivor. I'm going to flip the script on this thing. And whatever happens from this moment, I'm going to step into it and I'm going to try to make the people around me proud of how I'm handling it. And I'm really glad that that happened to me. That rock bottom moment happened to me before I ever went a step further because it gave me I got out of that car and thank God I didn't pass out or anything. I got out of that car and felt different. I felt like, like a deep breath of, okay, I know nothing's good. I know everything looks bad, but I know who I am inside and I'm going to grit and step, grit and step. And that's how I handled the next steps that I had because the next steps that I had were strange. You know, you know, I got sentenced um, in uh, November of 2013. So I had Thanksgiving and Christmas to go through. Yeah. And, it, you know, when you get sentenced and, you know, you have five years looking at you and you're going to voluntarily surrender every day, every hour, basically, is how do you handle it? You know, you inventory things differently. You talk to different people differently. You you push these people off that, that aren't important in your life to the people who are really important in your life and make sure you have conversations with them and you're doing things with them. And um, I did that between that time period. And, and, um, and it's strange because once you get to that point, it was January 14th of 2014, I went and stood at the gates of Leavenworth and you're just ready to get it started and over. And I remember standing there cause I had hugged my wife and my mom and my brother in the car and I went and stood and it was such a cold day. I took my coat off cause I didn't want him to have my coat. And, um, I, uh, went to the gates there and I, I stood and freezing cold in January, Kansas wind going through. And I was thinking everything that I know, everything that I love is behind me and everything in front of me is, the total unknown, total unknown. So, Damn. but my, but my thing, my thought was the moment I had hit rock bottom, I'm going to take this. I'm going to grit it. I'm going to step. I'm going to, I'm going to adapt. I'm going to get it. And that's really what got me through because, um, man, it's a weird thing to step into prison. What? So you're standing on the gates and you're ready to walk in. I mean, are you nervous, you know, based yeah. on, 
Scared. Scared based on like, you know, movies, the media, how they portray certain prisons. I mean, I don't know what Leavenworth worth is like, or is it a federal or prison or anything? Or Federal like, prison. Okay. Yeah. And, and the thing of it is, everybody kind of knows Leavenworth because it's in the movies and stuff. So, uh, and I, you know, I had tried to do research, you know, what do prisons look like inside? And you can't really see too many federal prisons inside. You can see state prisons inside, but they don't let too many federal prisons go. But, you know, you have this, you know, am I going to get raped? Am I going to get you know, yeah. stabbed? Am I going to get all these crazy thoughts that go through your head? And, you know, the first thing that they do is they completely prisonize you as you go through processing. You, know, you can feel it coming off your skin. Your freedom literally is shed from you. And they put you in different clothes and and put you in a cell. And you don't know when you're going to be out of that cell and you know when anybody's going to come get you. And you start to realize is that you have no control over anything. You're You're there. And that's when you realize that you've got to get some strategies to get through it and so because, and so that's what kind of sparked the writing of the book is like learning strategies to get through it well one of the things that happened to me was is that you know when they finally came and the, got me out of that cell and took me to um where i was going to be yeah it was pretty surprising because you know my world had gone into being a, a you know pretty wealthy person to being led into this room with you know uh, fifty bunk beds, uh, a locker, and a plastic chair. Yeah. But this Hispanic guy came up to me and he, he said, "Hey, hey, you're my bunkie." He said, "Wow." He said, "You look like you've never been here before. You're going to need a lot of help." Oh, no. So he immediately, you know, he takes my bedding stuff and he says, we got to make this military style. You got to learn how to do this because the warden comes through every Friday. We're going to do this. And so he starts making my bed and then he, he goes into my locker. He's like, oh man, we got to clean this out. Can't put anything in there. And I'm like, wow, this guy's, this guy's, a, he's helping me. And then he immediately takes me over to the other side of the room. He says, follow me. And there's a guy that's a little bit older than me. And he says, Jim Clark, Brent Cassidy. He's one of you. Help him out. <laughs> I'm just standing there and I introduce myself and I find out that Jim Clark is eight years my senior. We both played basketball at the same high school and we make this connection. And then he starts helping me, tells me I can, you know, go down and I can make a phone call at the counselor's office to my family, tell them I'm okay. And from that moment on, I, I remember that phone call that I made, and this is just like an hour after I've been there, you know, I get on the phone and, and I, and Julie answers and kids are on the other line on the other side of the line here. And, and I said, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Well, just don't worry about me. And it was okay. It, the, the thing that I found and the thing that I think that everybody is listening out there, um, Nothing is ever as bad as your mind makes it out to be. Oh, that's the truth. Nothing, not even prison. Yeah. What I had built up that was going to happen to me within the first hour of prison was a complete flip of my mind of what really happened. And, you know, how I survived in that prison uh, was you know, probably unique to me because everybody goes through prison differently. There's some interesting things though that happen. Like Shawshank Redemption has, uh, the movie has some interesting lines in it. Uh, when he's, one is, is get busy living or get busy dying. There's only two types of prisoners in prison. The ones that have given up and the ones that are trying to make it. And you see them. And my, my biggest fear in prison was, is being institutionalized, losing what, what made me me. And so I, I remember the first night I was in and, it, you know, we, so there was the big prison on top of the hill and we were at the camp. It was all lit up. So you, and the whole place is lit up obviously. Yeah. And I was looking up at the top of the hill and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is up to all this has happened. Here I am. I'm in Leavenworth. I'm in this bed. And I'm looking up at this huge castle on the hill. 
I'm going to have to do what I've always done. I got to set some goals and figure out, you know, what I got to do because that's what I've always done. Nice. And I got out a pencil and, and piece of paper and there was light coming through the bathroom and I wrote down some goals to get through my steps of what I thought I needed to do. And um, from that point forward, that was the thing that steadied me to continue to be me. And um, that's how I got through the whole thing was, is I, I, I had a mind hack that, you know, I got a job at the food warehouse and I was the uh, clerk and I took the inventory and all these things that I learned how to, you know, I got for forklift certified. I was doing things to try to trick myself into that. I was learning things, doing things. Sure. And those are the things that, that I, I, you know, when I go out and speak, I, I've got, you know, five survival tools that I talk about um, how to get through prison life business, they all, they all fit. Um, I could go through those real quick if you want me to. Well, I, I just made a note of it so I could remember it if you wanted to share that. And that way I would remember it, that we could talk about that. And so I wouldn't forget about it. So yeah. Yeah. I think. So be- the, well, the first one was, is uh, when you're in a new place, man, humble yourself, look around, don't say a lot, figure out who's getting it right. Who's doing things that you would like to be doing that you think are doing it right. And then go talk to them. Sure. How how are you doing it, man? What are you doing? And, and figure out how to implement that into your routine. I did that in business when I was, you know, a 20 something executive. And I found out it worked really good in prison because when I started talking to those guys that I saw that, you know, this guy has a good prison job. This guy's got a good workout routine. This guy's reading books. How do I get to that? How do I get to this? starting talking to those people and it started helping me get into my own routine of the routine I wanted to get into. The second thing was, it's like Shawshank Redemption. Andy, he, he, he chips through that wall for 19 years Correct. to his freedom. He, every day he lets out that wall as oh. his personal victory. All right. He rewards himself. Everybody's got to have their Zaywan Taneo. Andy Zaywantaneo was if he if he could get through that wall, he had the whitest of the white sands, the bluest of the bluest waters. He's gonna fish. He's gonna fix up that old fishing boat and that old inn, and he's gonna have everybody over, and it's all gonna be good. And that was his Zaywantaneo. Everybody has to have their Zaywantaneo, regardless of where they are. It keeps you alive. It keeps you moving forward. It gives you a goal. It gives you a plan. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in prison. You can be in a bad neighborhood. You can be in a bad marriage. You can be bad, wherever you are, find your Zaywan Taneo because that is the passion part that you're going to need to get through. Love that. The, the third thing was, is that my daughter made me a calendar every year that I was in prison, my youngest daughter, and it had the family pictures above. And every night in my routine was, is I would write in the box of that day. And it was to try to find the win, the win for the day. And I would write that down. And if I didn't have a win for that day, I would let myself go all the way down because everybody has a bad day and clearly everybody has a bad day in prison. But the trick and the hack that I used was, Chris, is never have two bad days, never have two bad boxes. Because if you do that, that can turn into a week, it can turn into a month, it can turn into a year and you go into a spiral. It's like Jack Nicholas said, don't, you know, it's okay to hit a bad shot. Just don't hit two in a row. It really messes up the hole. <laughs> <laughs> just don't do it. I like that. The, the, the fourth thing was uh, learn from your mistakes. I mean, that was a big one for me. But um, they don't define you. They only make you wiser. I think our whole society worries about making mistakes. I agree. All the business books that you can read is all about the guys who built these gigantic worlds. And they've made them through mistakes and they've learned and they've gone forward. So don't beat yourself up on mistakes. Learn from mistakes, make you wiser and get you through it. And you will get through it. The fifth one was the one that I was the most worried about. Don't give in. Don't give up. Keep being yourself regardless of the circumstances. Otherwise, you will lose what makes you you. And I was absolutely petrified to become an institutionalized. I, you know, When guys got close to the door of getting out for their freedom, a lot of guys would catch another charge because what happened was, is they got into these ugly routines, prison, ugly prison routines became their comfort. 
And they, what became fearful to them was this freedom because that became the unfamiliar. And they would catch another charge because they, they could stay further in prison. What I found out, though, Chris, is that a lot of people, when I got out, I started recognizing that, gosh, there's a lot of people that are institutionalized that are becoming like prisoners in their own mind, sure. you know, whether it's a bad marriage, a bad job, a health crisis, whatever it could be. And they get into this ugly, awful routine, but that's the routine they know. And I, I always say that becomes the warden of your freedom because you're afraid to step out of that to what you really want. Whatever sets you free, you've got to get out of your comfort zone because that's the thing that that unknown piece is probably the thing that you, the thing you fear the most is the thing you probably want. And you've got to figure out how to step through it. Mm. So I used those things, those five things and kept them close to me to recognize when I was kind of getting off into the ditch uh, to bring me back home. And it really did steady me in an, in an environment that I was very unfamiliar with. Uh, you know, and I, I can say this about prison. There was a lot of good guys in prison. Um, a lot of people think, you know, there's prison creatures, you know, because they don't know a lot of people that have gone to prison. But there was a lot of people that were good guys in prison. They had done some things that, you know, they made a mistake and then they got in there. But um, it's the thing that I think that is the toughest thing in our society because the hard part is getting out, you know, the reentry part. Um, the, the statistics are horrible. You know, two thirds go back in three years, three fourths go back in five years. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but you know, there's some that are built in, you know, if you've got to go for a job, you've got to check the box that you're a felon. If you've got to go look, look for a place to live and you don't have any support, you've got to check that box and then they won't rent a place to you. So there's, if you can't get a place to live or get a job, you might fall back into some bad things. My hope is, is that, and one of the reasons why I do the podcast is, is that uh, it gives a platform for these guys to tell their story and women to tell their stories. And I think a couple of different things happen on the Nightmare Success podcast. One is that, um, well, maybe they're not prison creatures. Uh, two is, well, maybe if I got into a dark place here, I could use some of those strategies. And the third thing is, is that, wow, you know, if I come across somebody, I might give them a second look and maybe not judge a book by its cover. And if that would happen, then there'll be a lot more second chances out there. And that'd be a good thing. What do you think? I'm trying to figure out how I need to, or want to word this, that. Okay. So do you think going to prison, you know, like you said, one of your first, tools was to humble yourself and that humbled you and you learned some life lessons along the way and figured like, you know, okay, you know, we, we talked about right in the beginning where life was perfect almost, you know, gummy berries and raindrops and everything. But, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. But if, if you wouldn't have went to prison, do you think your life would have turned out, you know, stay in gummy bears and raindrops forever and forever until the side you just, it's like, hey, I'll just go retire and just, you know, sit my ties on the beach and or go to your Ante Centineo or what or what do you take? Well, I guess that's what I'm asking. What do you take what went differently if you didn't go to prison? Okay. So I, I think that's a great question because um there was a lot of things I appreciated before I went to prison. I mean, I, I had a family and I loved being with them and and um, you know, there was nothing more than I loved the family getting together and being together and all those things. So I had that. I didn't have a misplaced uh, priority of where that was. One thing I can say though about, you know, money, because at one time I had a lot of it. It's just, you don't worry about that anymore. Yeah. It's like, you know, Forrest Gump said in the movie, you know, uh, we all, you had a lot of money. Well, we don't have to worry about that, I guess. Uh -huh. But, but, you know, having a lot of money doesn't solve problems. It just means you don't worry about money. You have all the other problems. Um, one of the things that I've learned by going to prison is that I look at things differently. Uh, I look at people differently. Um, I, I don't in, in at all judge a book by its cover because I had some people that didn't look like me, but were fascinating and were smart and were caring. And, um, you know, they had a real reason for wanting to be into, you know, society for a second chance in life. So 
for me, if I wouldn't have had that experience, I wouldn't have had that understanding and maybe that passion for uh, the need for us to continue to change our society to let those people back in. So that really opened up my world because when you get wealthy, your world gets smaller. You know, people who have wealth, you know, they end up being at the same places and the clubs and the vacations and whatever. So your world gets smaller. My world got a lot wider when I had a plastic chair, a locker and a bunk bed because you, you understand things better and your perspective changes and, and uh, your understanding of people becomes a lot more real because nobody's going anywhere. Everybody's there and you, you figure out, you know, how it works. And, and that's the, that's the crazy thing about prison. Everybody goes in by themselves and everybody goes out by themselves. And what happens while you're in there is what you make of it. It's, it's a uh, very hardcore high school. That's a good way to say that. I never thought about it that way, but yes, I would agree a hundred percent. And But it did open my eyes though, Chris. It's a great, it's a, it's a great deep question, but um, it changed my, perspective on how I look at people. And I'm a much more open to hearing the story. Yeah. Uh, you know, the gossip and all, you know, Hey, Hey, you know, did you hear that guy did? Well, you know what? Until I meet that guy, I, I want to hear his side. Yeah. What well, also seems like based on a little bit, what you said earlier about right before you went into prison too, that, you know, you were having these conversations and trying to say, Hey, to everybody before you went. Yeah. But also you knew that, it kind of, yeah, that you knew that you were having a deeper meaning for life now. Does that, you know, you wanted to, you know, it was like almost knowing that, hey, you know, tomorrow I'm going, I could be dead, you know, and now yes. I got to, everything's right. You know, go say hey to a friend I haven't talked to in five years and, and, and stuff like that. And all that really happens, Chris. I mean, that, that, I that is a real thing. I agree. And it's just one of those things that, you know, it's where, People run off their lives and momentum, I like to always say, or but and yeah. uh, you know, they forget about calling, you know, their one of their good friends. Like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Then you know, yeah, like, really I'll tomorrow. get to it. Yeah, I'll get to it later. Then you know, that you know, that day turns into a week and a week turns into two weeks. And yeah. And then you forget and all of a sudden, you know, something happens, you're like, oh shit. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you have that oh shit moment. Like, what the hell? Or about somebody that? dies, you know, that that's exactly. the other thing. I mean, somebody could actually die and you're like, Oh my god, I was gonna I was I was gonna. And yeah. it didn't happen. Yeah. Do you, and I want to ask this real quick that, you know, you were talking about how people or prisoners when they get out of prison, which I think, did you say two thirds? I can't remember exactly, but yeah, two thirds go back in three years and three fourths go back in five years, which is an unbelievable number, by the way. <laughs> is, is that just because, you know, they're in for prison for, you know, a certain amount of time and they set up a routine and they know their life and they know exactly how things are going. But then when they get outside into the real world again, you know, there's so many variables that are changing and they don't know, they don't have that routine anymore. They don't have what they know and they're stepping out of their comfort zone in a sense, but they just don't, yeah. they can't grasp it, I guess. And I think what happens is that oddly enough, their comfort zone becomes the prison. Uh, as much as you hate prison, uh, it, it definitely puts you into a routine. I mean, lights go out at 10 o'clock, you know, you get up and, you know, count is at a certain time. And if you're not at count, you know, you're going to get thrown in the hole. Um, there, there's certain things that happen in prison that you get into a routine that you don't even think about. And when you get out of prison, you have to think about everything. You know, I always say it's kind of like jumping into a moving car when you get out of prison. You have to catch back up to the time that you missed and you want to fit back in. So people don't think you're weird. There's a, there's a weird dynamic that happens when you get out of prison. Um, people are all assumptive that, Oh my God, you must be incredibly happy to be out of prison. Absolutely. It's like Christmas morning as a five-year-old times a million, sure. but uh, there's a lot of things that are running through your mind. You're like, okay, so the family's gone on, you know, five years here. How am I going to fit back? I want to make sure that I'm still the same guy. I don't want to think I'm any different, you know, but I don't want to change anything that they're doing. And then what am I going to do for a job? Like, how am I, how are my friends going to accept me? Well, what are people going to think when I walk into a room as an extra? All these things roll into your head as freedom comes. 
and you're dealing with all of it, all of it at once. Um, and when you're in prison, time moves like molasses. You know, I, I heard a guy say that prison is like black and white and getting out is like in color and how you handle that movement. You know, like if you go to like, I remember going, we went to a quick trip. There was like gas station, you know, mini mart thing. And, and it was so much going on. And I was with my girls and my wife and, and I was like, Oh my God. And, and, and then we went to go pay for the candy and stuff. They were getting, and they said, dad, you got to pay. Like I hadn't paid for years. And I, <laughs> the whole thing was just like sensory overload. I feel like an idiot, but it takes you a little bit just to get your feet back from, you know, underneath you. But there's another thing that I, that I heard, and I wish I could say it was mine, but I think it's incredibly interesting. There's a guy, his name is Devin West, and he was a big football player in Texas. And he got rolled up into drugs and got it put into prison. Yeah, He was having a hard time. And this old man who had been in for a long time came up to him and he said, son, you're not doing well at all. He said, you're not going to make it. If you keep doing your time like this, he says, you got to understand. He said, prison's like a boiling pot of water. He said, do you understand what I'm saying? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I'm not sure if I'd understand. He said, well, if I put a carrot in that water, he said, what happens to the carrot? What's the water do to the carrot? He said, well, it makes it soft. He said, okay. He said, you can't get soft in here because you got to still be able to be you and protect yourself. Okay. He said, now, if I put an egg in that water, what's the water do to the egg? So it'll make it hard. So you can't get hard, can't lose your heart, can't lose your empathy, your sympathy for being who you are. He said, now, I put a coffee bean in that water. He said, what's that do to the water? He said, I'm, I'm not following. He said, that coffee bean changes the water to coffee. He said, that's what you got to be in prison. You got to change the water. And I thought that was so wow. insightful to not just prison, just you know, yeah. how do you make it? How do you make a difference? Yeah, and you, you got to be the coffee bean. Man, you can use that across in all aspects in life, man. I like that. But wow, but Brent, I think we should uh, take this home on there. That right there, you got to be the coffee bean. Got to be the coffee bean. But if people want to find your book, want to find a podcast yeah. or anything you want to plug, feel free to do that. Okay, so uh, the book Nightmare Success. Um, can be found on uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Nightmare Success In and Out can pretty much be found anywhere you go for your podcast, you know, Apple, Odyssey, Spotify, Apple Music, all those good places. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd love people people to tune in because there's some really great stories that uh, I get to talk to and I, I get the benefit of being the guy that gets to hear them That's sitting awesome. in the chair. That's awesome, man. Well, Again, thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your story. And it was very enlightening, man. I really appreciate it. It was you could spread it was it. an honor, Chris, to be on your podcast. I appreciate you. Okay. Well, all right. Well, on that note, yeah, be the coffee bean, people. Be right. the coffee bean. Love it. <laughs> See you.